Bowles says, yes, our God, God Almighty, made heaven and earth and you and me, made a way for us. It's incumbent upon us that we say, yes, Lord. Are we saying, yes, Lord? I need to say, yes, Lord. So much keeps happening and a scripture bounced into my heart and I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, before I start my mes message. No temptation. No temptation. Doesn't matter what it is, no temptation. Has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. I'm reading from the King James Version. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, with the temptation, with the temptation, it may not run away right away. But with the temptation, he will, God will, also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. This scripture bopped into my head. It goes with the message. We need to remember our God's in control. We need to remember God has a plan. And as we just said, extemporaneously, I think that's a 25 cent word that's right, on the spur of the moment, we just sang it. We need to say yes. We need to say yes. So let's read my scripture text. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your praises. We thank you for your people. Lord, we thank you for our bishop, both bishops, Stanley and Ruth Cho. Lord, we thank you for our pastors, Stanley and Marsha Cho. And Lord, we thank you for all the ministers, and we thank you for our brothers and sisters. Lord, you said the body is compacted by that which every joint supplies. And a lot of joints are sitting up in here today. We need everybody in here. That's why you're speaking in our hearing what you spoke to me this week. Lord, help me to speak exactly what you spoke. No more, no less. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen. I'm going to take a text from Genesis chapter 6 and then another text from 2 Peter chapter 3. The first scripture text from Genesis chapter 6. The second scripture text from 2 Peter chapter 3. And reading from Genesis chapter 6, verses 17 and 18 from the King James Version. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. This is God speaking to Noah. I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein the breath, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. But, verse 18 starts with, but with thee, God speaking to Noah, but with thee I will establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark. Repeat after me, please. Come into the ark. One more time, please. Come into the ark. And reading back again, the middle part of verse 18, Genesis chapter 6, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Now to Second Peter, chapter 3, one verse, verse 9, out of the King James Version. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 reads, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repeat after me, not willing that any should perish. Please repeat after me one more time. Come into 
the ark. My title today, God saves, get in the ark. God saves, get into the ark. I want to introduce to you God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and you and me. The earth, heaven belongs to God, and the earth is his footstool. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He is God Almighty. It is said of God that he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What he says goes. When he says stop, it stops. When he says go, it goes. And when he says let COVID put everybody in timeout, everybody goes in timeout. And when he says it's done, it's done. I would like to introduce some characteristics about our God and Heavenly Father in heaven. He loves us. He loves us. And God is ready, willing, and able to save us from destruction. He's in the saving business because he's in the loving business. And guess who needs saving? Moi. And vous. In Brooklyn, that's you guys. We are the ones that need saving. And our God loves us so much. We know it, John 3, 16. God so loved you guys and me, vous, my French bad? Moi, vous. Sorry, I only speak Pepe Le Pew French. Look at the old cartoons, you know what that is. God is in the savings business. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. God is in the saving business business. He's ready, willing, and able to save us from destruction. I want to reintroduce to some and introduce to others God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in the saving business for us whom he loves because we are born lost in sin. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. And it says here, as Peter's recounting some of the history, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world. See, the old world was acting the fool. After God made it and after Adam and Eve sinned, it was on Adam because he was in charge. And because Adam sinned, we are all, and this creation, all under sin. And folks were acting the fool. Go read it for yourself. It says man's thought was continually wicked, mean, nasty. And God says enough is enough. And I'm sure he didn't quote Popeye. Popeye must have been quoting God Almighty when he says, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. As you can tell, I spent a lot of my formative years watching TV, cartoons, and they're in my mind. But it works. It works. God said, that's all I can stand. And he destroyed the old world because of their wickedness. But Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, But saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of, again, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were acting the fool also, into ashes and condemning them with an overthrow, making them, what does it say here? I didn't write this, but it's in here. Making them an example unto those who should live ungodly. But, in verse 7, delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And now focusing on verse 9. Of Second Peter, chapter two. The Lord knoweth. Repeat after me. The Lord, the Lord knoweth, knoweth how to deliver, how to deliver the, godly the godly 
out of temptations. Do we see a theme here today? God saves. God saves. He loves us. And he's God Almighty. And whatever he says goes. I think it's in Isaiah 55 where it says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are. Uh, your, th your thoughts are not like my thoughts because my ways as high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And God also said his word does not return unto him void, but it's going to accomplish exactly what he sends it to do. And it says here, he knows how to rescue the godly from out of temptation. And it also says to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. It says in the word of God, the soul that sinneth shall die. And the folks were acting the fool in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were acting the fool in Noah's day. But I want you to see, God knows whose are his and who refused to be his. Yeah, that's the way I said it. God knows whose are his. And God knows who refused to be his. Go back and read. It's not in my scripture. You read it. John 3, 16 and 17, where it says, this is the condemnation in the world that light came into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Because you see, Jesus came that whomsoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. See, our God is in the saving business. But you know, there is a historical pattern that I hope we don't repeat, hence this word. Matthew 23, verse 37 and 38. And we're talking about when Jesus walked this earth in Jerusalem on the way to the cross. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. By him was all the worlds made and everything that was made was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Yes, we're talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. John chapter 1. Verse 1. But we're looking at Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus is speaking here. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent to the, how often would I, Jesus is speaking, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In the New Living Translation, it says, how often would I have gathered your children together, but you wouldn't let me. Our God is a God Almighty. He is able to save to the uttermost, it says in the Old Testament. Actually, that's in Hebrews, and it's one of my scriptures, I believe. But do you know, back in the day, you had folks refusing to be saved. Refusing to be saved. Sounds far-fetched, huh? Sounds far-fetched. I'm going to bring a scripture to your mind, and I hope everybody remembers it because it may just make my sermon really short. Everybody knows Jesus was crucified, right? Yes. Now, this is a yes or no question. Was he crucified by himself? No. That's right. Tyler, who was Jesus crucified with? Two thieves. Not one. Two. Two. You ever wonder why he wasn't crucified by himself? You ever wonder why the scripture said that he made his bed with uh, malefactors? It was prophesied. You ever wondered why? And why only two? You ever wondered why it wasn't just Jesus that was crucified, but there were two crucified? You ever wonder why it was one on his left and one on his right? Amen. It's about choice. Now, 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 now. We know about one thief on the cross, right? But let me tell you, if you read the accounts carefully in the four Gospels, you will see that both of those thieves were acting a fool. Not one, both. If you are the son of God, why don't you do this? Yeah, why don't you do that? Why don't you do Both were acting the fool. 
But we all know what happened to one of the two. He said, wait a minute. He didn't do nothing wrong. I know why I'm here. I know why you're here. He didn't do anything wrong. We're getting what we deserve. Not him. Even when Jesus was dying, he was dying so different, they knew there was a difference in his life. We should be living like there's a difference in our lives. There were two thieves, not three. Two thieves, and they were both acting a fool, dying in their sins. Two thieves. One came to his senses. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, this is the Danny paraphrase. You good. You good. Gotcha. BFF. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know all this stuff. <laughs> no, but, but here's the question. Here's the question. What was the other thief thinking? Wait, wait. Let, 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 let's, let's recap this. This may just... Sh- Cut the message in half. Three crucified. Capital punishment. They dying. One's dying different. All the crowd is catcalling on one of them. Actually, given his whole testimony. He healed others. He saved others. Two were very guilty, knew they were guilty, and they were dying. One said... Wait a minute. This guy's different. I deserve this. Remember me. Ask for help. Got the help. Asked to be saved. Was saved. My question is, what was the other guy thinking? He was right there. He had an example set for him. He could have asked too. He knew he was dying. He knew he was dying. That was not in question. What was he thinking? You know what I have to ask myself when God spoke that to me? What was I thinking? I know I'm dying. None of us live forever. The Bible says it's appointed unto us once to die and afterwards the judgment. None of us live forever. I have to ask myself, what was I thinking? The same Jesus is available to me. The subject of the message is God saves. Get into the ark. Jesus is our ark. But we can't just sing about Jesus. We got to get in the ark. God has prepared an ark. We've set enough background. We know that God judges because he's a holy God. He's a righteous God. And you can't act a fool on his watch. And it's all his watch. And though he's going to bring the hammer down hard, but it's not his will that any should perish. That's why he makes a way to escape. Jesus is our ark. But you got to get into the ark. You can't just look at the ark. You can't just rejoice for the ark. You can't just be happy that God sent an ark. Can't be taking pictures with you at the ark. You got to get into the ark. We can sing Jesus. We can praise Jesus. We can call on Jesus. He'll answer prayer. But you have to get into the ark. Another Old Testament example in Egypt. God heard the cries of his people from Abraham. He says, I'm going to get them out of there. Moses, you're my man. Go to Pharaoh who has enslaved my people. Tell him to let my people go. Read it for yourself. And the very last thing that God brought on Egypt, all kinds of plagues on Egypt. By the way, none of the plagues on Goshen where God's people were living. They were just on Egypt. Egypt. But this last one was going to wipe out all the firstborn. This one was going to be the last. God called him the death angel. He says, I'm sending him through, 
and he's killing every firstborn. But God prepared an ark for his people. He said, for my people, Moses, let them know this straight, take the blood of a lamb, typifying Jesus, and take that blood and put it on the doorpost. All the doors had posts. We're talking about the entryway of the house, the first part you see of the house. He says, put the blood on the doorpost and tell them this, stay in the house. Stay in the house under the blood. Don't come out. It's not going to be good for you if you come out. Can't save you if you come out. But you do as I say. Put the blood. Stay in the house. You'll be good. God saves. But we have to get into the ark. I'll tell you another one. I'm paraphrasing a lot of this. You go home and read it. If you go back to look at Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is in Genesis chapter, I think it's 16. And you're going to see in Genesis, Genesis chapter 19, like we said in the other scripture, they were acting the fool. You know how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah was? It's a long time since got Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah is still known for being Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was so wicked way back then that Sodom and Gomorrah is still known for being wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to read a few verses from Genesis chapter 19. You go back and read it for yourself, and I want you to see that God saves. But you've got to get into the ark. I'm reading from the King James Version, Genesis chapter 19. You're not going to believe this when you hear it, but you've got to read it for yourself. Verse 12, and the men said to Lot, the angels of God sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, hast thou any here besides? You have a son-in-law? Do you have sons? Do you have daughters? Whatsoever you have in the city, all your friends, all your relatives, get them out. God came to save all of Lot's family. Now, if you read before this, God told Abraham ahead of time what was going to happen. So Abraham would intercede just so you could get the record that God is not destroying the righteous with the unrighteous. He's not like that. He's not about that. Why do you think God goes and tells Abraham and have Abraham barter with God and intercede with God? Oh, oh what, 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 what if there's 20? What if there's 15? What if there's 10? And God keeps telling, reestablishing it in the scriptures for us to know over and over again, nope, I'm not going to destroy the whole city. I'll let it live if at least there's 10 walking with me. The point is, God is not destroying the righteous with the unrighteous. God's about saving. Amen. So here it is in verse 12 of chapter 19. He's coming to save all of Lot's family. Verse 13, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. You know, his son-in-laws were going to be saved, but they refused. They were in the number. The angels were going to save all of Lot's family, but the son-in-law said, this is a joke. We don't feel like laughing. They refused to be saved. So, when it came to pass... After the angels had dragged them out and told them to get going, they said, escape for your life and look not behind thee, neither stay in all of the plain. Go to the mountains, lest you be consumed. Haste, hurry, escape, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. The angel was constrained by God to get his people out first. Then the fireworks was going to start. And I emphasize, they came for the whole family. The son-in-law just playing out, flat out, refused, didn't want to be bothered. They got left. So it was just Lot, his daughters, and his wife. And here it says in verse 23, when the sun was risen, Lot entered into Zor. He made it. 
Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He made it. He made it to the city, and as soon as he was safe, all the fireworks started on Sodom and Gomorrah. He made it. Lot, his daughters, Lot and his daughters. You know, the wife went out too. Here comes the strong part of God's word. You have to get into the ark. And it's easy to get into the ark. But you have to get into the ark. God tells us how to get into the ark. He tells us what we have to do. It's easy. He says, take my yoke upon me. Take your, his yoke upon yourself. Now, a yoke is going to constrain. It's going to cramp your style. Some of the stuff you used to do, you can't do. Some of the stuff you may still want to do, you shouldn't do and you won't, you won't be able to do. The yoke is going to constrain us. God is going to constrain us. He's going to cramp our style a little bit. Maybe he cramps our style a lot. It depends on your style. But what does he say? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We have to get into the ark. We can only get into the ark by following what God says to do to get into the ark. Our ark is Jesus. Sodom and Gomorrah was an example. God would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And he was ready to pull out all of Lot's family. Some wouldn't go and refuse being saved. Saved. God came down as Jesus and was ready to save all of Jerusalem, came onto his own, and his own received him not. And they refused him. He was trying to save them. And here he's trying to save Lot's entire family because he's serious about judging sin. The son-in-laws wouldn't go. The wife walked all that way, got all that way into, into safety, and disobeyed the order looking back. It wasn't just a matter of looking back. It, it was about looking back, but it wasn't about looking back. It was about longing. You know, you can't get into the ark until you get out. Why are we getting in the ark? Because God wants us saved. Why does he want to save from? It's not appointed for us to, for wrath. But wrath is coming on all the ungodly. We got to come out from among them and be separate and not be partakers of their sins. We have to get into the ark, but you can't get into the ark till you get out from the mess. And you know something? We're not talking about a physical repositioning. We're talking about a change of heart. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? It's the mind. God give us power with his Holy Spirit that if we just agree with him, that Holy Spirit will give us power and transform us. Bring us into looking more like Jesus. It's called a sanctification process. It happens over time. But you have to be willing in your mind. You have to come into the ark the way God said to come into the ark. His wife was looking back like, oh, I miss that. God says, you don't want out? I can't save you. And she was lost. Even though she made it all the way to safely. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. It's really easy to get into the ark. Romans 10, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness... But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's easy to get into the ark. But repentance is required to get into the ark. We've got to do it God's way. Remember, it's his ark. It is he that made us, not we ourselves. Can you imagine me? God comes to save me. And I say, oh, wait a minute. I want to do it like this. Let's keep some of this. Let's do some of that. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He's God Almighty and I'm not. Now, in conclusion, the word for us, and God told me it was an urgent word. 
because of the scriptures that says the times we're in right now. First Thessalonians chapter five. Verses one through nine, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. First Thessalonians chapter five. For yourselves know perfectly of the day of the Lord cometh so as a thief in the night. For when they shall all say peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon them as tra travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We're talking about judgment coming for all the mess and all the foolishness that's going on. Amen. But look, at, it didn't say suddenly, suddenly coming suddenly. It says suddenly coming like travail upon a woman with child. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe some of us don't know. I certainly know because I have um, been a uh, father for a long time and my kids are grown and I was there when they were born. A woman doesn't get pregnant and give birth right away. There's nine months of evidence. First she knows and then everybody knows. Okay? So when we're talking about sudden like the travail of a woman, we're talking, yeah, it was sudden, they didn't know what day the baby was going to come, but the baby was coming. And everybody knew the baby was coming. Everybody knew the baby was coming and the baby was coming. Well, I'm telling you, everybody knows the baby's coming. And he's sure enough going to judge this earth. And that's what the scripture says next in verse 4. But brethren, you are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. We know what God said. When you see the fig leaves, you know it's spring. When you see all this stuff starts to happen know that it is close. Ye are children of the light, reading verse 5, and children of the day. We are not of the night, not of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet, the hope of salvation. And repeat after me, verse 9, for God, for God. Hath, not hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God saves. Get into the ark. Our God is about saving, but you got to get into the ark. You can't get into the ark till you come out from the mess, come out from what everybody else is doing, come out from the foolishness. There has to be a difference because God's not playing. When he says he's going to judge, he's going to judge. But that's not for us. He didn't appoint it for us. Do you know hell was created for the devil and his angels and not for us? God is about saving us, but we got to get into the ark. Now, for those that may still have trepidation, for those that think that this may be a downer, one more thing about the ark. There's a party in the ark. Hey, hey, hey. There's a party in the ark. It's happening in the ark. They throwing down in the ark. It says in his presence are pleasures forevermore, fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's a party in the ark. What does it say? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there's many mansions. Danny, paraphrase here. There's a party in the ark. I go to prepare a place for you. There's a party in the ark that where I am, there you'll be also because there's a party in the ark. Jesus at the Last Supper, this is first Sunday, he says, this is the fruit of the wine. I'm not drinking it anymore until I see you and we drink it afresh in heaven. Why? Because there's a party in the ark. God is about saving He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. The soul that sinned, it's going to die. Highlight it. What he says is coming to pass. But that is not for us. God's in the saving business. Who is he going to save? Whomsoever will. He's prepared an ark. You got to get in.
to the ark. And, and in addition to being saved, there's a party in the ark. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for saying that Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for the hope that we have today. Lord, weeping may endure for a season, but joy comes in the morning because there's a party in the ark. Come before his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name because there's a party in the ark. There's a party in the ark, and his name is Jesus. All the praise goes to Jesus. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Read it in Revelation. There's a party going on in the ark, 24-7, 365. Judgment falling all over the earth, but there's still a party going on in the ark. God comes to save, but we got to get into the ark. Remember, no selfies. Get in. To the ark. Get in. Don't just party about the ark. Get into the ark. It's serious. Get into the ark. Why is God saying this? Because we have to get into the ark. And when we get in, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because the Holy Ghost party, don't stop. Don't stop. It doesn't stop. God bless us down here. We can have a good time down here. But Jesus says, whoever drinks from this water, you're going to get thirsty all over again. But when we get what he gives us, no more thirsty. Because ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. There's a party in the ark. His name is Jesus. We have to get into the ark. Don't refuse. Get into the ark. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. Hello and welcome to NEP Ministries. My name is Pastor Lee Choate and this is my lovely wife, Marsha Choate. And we're so thankful that you chose to be here with us today. We know you have lots of choices to listen and to stream from, but we're glad that you chose to be here with us today. Yes, you are welcome to worship with us every Sunday morning yes. at 11 a.m. at 955 Bridge Street here in Pelham, New Hampshire. Yes, it's an awesome time. And if you'd like to donate, please see us at Venmo or Cash App. Our tag is NEP Ministries. You can also go to our church website, at nepministries.org slash donate. And we have a model here at NEP. It's whether you're from the north, south, east, or west, come to NEP and you shall be blessed. Amen.